Sometimes as a financial advisor, I can get a little bit carried away with the complex strategies. So asset structuring, tax minimization, investment allocation, super contributions, that kind of thing. But the truth is a strong financial position is built off the back of the basics. And one of those basics is your account structure. When it comes to managing your finances, an appropriate account structure can really be the backbone of your success because it's gonna help you to track, manage, allocate, and automate your cash flow in line with your financial plan. So in today's video, we're gonna do a deep dive into how you should think about structuring your accounts. Now this is gonna be a pretty long one, so grab yourself a coffee, get comfortable, and let's jump in. Hello guys, Brad here from The Guided Investor. Welcome back to the channel for another video. If you're new here, consider hitting that subscribe button because I post regular videos about how you can do more with your money. And today we are talking about account structures. To build meaningful wealth, you need to know and understand your personal profit and loss statement. That is what money is coming in and what money is going out. This refers to your ability to track your cash flow. For this to be effective, you need to be able to track your cash flow at a simple glance. It should only take you two minutes to know if you are on track or not. And if it takes any longer than this, then as human beings, we are inherently lazy. So we're probably not gonna do it, or at least we're not gonna do it often enough. But with an effective account structure, you're gonna be able to track your cash flow at a glance, which is what we want. You don't need any Excel spreadsheets. You don't need any budgeting apps you should be able to do it simply with your account structure. By easily tracking your cash flow, you can then better manage it. You can see if you are spending too much and you need to cut back, or you can see if you have surplus which you need to allocate. If your expenses are too high, then you can make adjustments and you can really go back and drill down into the reasons why your expenditure is so high. Maybe it's because your budget was unrealistic or maybe you just had some anomalies. So maybe it was an expensive month, um, some unexpected expenses popped up, and that's the reasons why you're high. But either way, in order to be able to manage it properly, you need to be able to track it. Hopefully, by tracking your cash flow, you're gonna realize that there is some surplus there. And then you need to be able to allocate that surplus in order to build wealth. So it's your net cash flow, your income minus your expenses, which gives you your surplus, that is your tool that you're gonna use in order to build wealth. And in order to do that, you need to allocate it. Without allocating your money, it tends to disappear because it's very easy to spend money. And we tend to spend it on life's luxuries which might bring us short-term enjoyment or a little bit of satisfaction like a full belly. But at the end of the day, it's not really gonna bring, a lot of it doesn't bring meaningful happiness to your life. So it's important that you have a plan in order to be able to allocate that surplus to wealth building exercises that are gonna have a meaningful impact on your life. By allocating your cash flow efficiently, you're gonna start to build some really good financial habits. And those financial habits are gonna have a compounding effect over the medium to long term, which is gonna put you in front of the average person. And the best part is that your allocation can be done automatically. In order to make a meaningful difference to your financial situation, you need to be doing the right things consistently. Now, motivation can get you started and motivation is a great way to get started, but you can't rely on motivation over the medium to long term because motivation tends to disappear. And that's where automation comes in. Automation will keep you on track. It takes a little bit of time and effort to set up initially, but once it's set up, it's gonna work its magic by itself. And this means you're gonna be much more likely to achieve your financial goals because you've got that automation on your side. Now that we understand the importance of a well-structured account setup, let's dive into the mechanics of it. When it comes to setting up your account structures, I know a lot of people out there like to set up this complex web of accounts where they have different accounts for different purposes. But that's not me. I like to keep things pretty simple and structuring my accounts is no different. However, this is your account structure and your account structure can be as unique as your fingerprint. So if having multiple accounts for different purposes 
means that it works better for you, then by all means, go for it. So I'm gonna show you an account structure which suits your individual circumstances so you can make it nice and unique. Now, there are two accounts which I think are crucial for everyone to have. But outside of that, I will show you how you can build additional account structures around those accounts in order to personalize it for your situation. But the first account you are gonna need is a transaction account. As the name suggests, your transaction account is going to facilitate the flows of money. It's where income comes in and money goes out. And you can think of it a little bit like the heart and the body. It pumps money around the financial system to where it needs to go. The outflows are made up of two items, expenses and allocations. Now we'll start by talking about expenses first. The expenses which come out of your transaction account include loan repayments, food, groceries, rent, entertainment, school fees, and any other regular or small expense which pops up. Also coming out of your transaction account are your allocations. And this is any money that's purposely allocated for wealth building exercises. For example, this might be additional loan repayments, uh, investments, super contributions, that kind of thing. So for example, if you intend to put an extra $200 per week towards your mortgage, then that $200 per week is gonna come out as an allocation from your transaction account. If you intend to invest $1,000 per month into an investment portfolio, then that too is gonna to come out of your transaction account. The only items that won't come out of your transaction account are items that you have intentionally saved up for. So big items, think you know purchasing a new car or going on an expensive holiday. Those kinds of items are intentional spendings, which you've hopefully saved for, and they are gonna come out of your savings account, which we're gonna look at later. The amount of money that goes into your transaction account is going to be dictated by your budget. Now, if you have worked out a budget, you should have a good idea about what you need to spend every single month. At the end of every month, you should have at least one month's expenditure left in your transaction account. So for example, if your budget says that you spend $5,000 per month, then at the end of the month, you should have $5,000 left in your transaction account. And I always recommend retaining this buffer because at the end of the day, expenditure isn't perfect. You're gonna have some months which are very expensive and you're gonna have some months which are cheap. And by retaining this buffer in your account, it means that over time, it should average out pretty well. And those expensive months can be funded by the small months and you don't have to worry about your account being overdrawn. Over a three to six month period, you want to see that the final balance left in your transaction account is averaging out to roughly one month's expenditure. Now, if you're consistently drawing down more, then you need to go back and review your budget. And either A, your budget wasn't practical, so maybe you thought you'd spend less, but after reviewing everything, well, actually life's a little bit more expensive than you thought. Or maybe B, there are some expenses in there and you're spending too much. Either way, you need to address the issue. So if you don't currently have any savings and you are really living pay to pay, well then your first financial goal really should be to get that one month's buffer set up in your transaction account. And to summarize, your transaction account should be looking like this. The next account is a savings account and your savings account is gonna be a combination of your emergency fund and any additional savings on top of your emergency fund that you have for other purposes. Anytime you take money out of your savings account, it should be done consciously. So that means no tap and go from your savings account. And in fact, I would say you shouldn't even have a card available for your savings account. If money comes out of your savings account, it needs to be done intentionally. So for example, if you lose your job, and you need to fund short-term living expenses, well, this is an emergency, so you can dip into your savings account to do so. If you want to buy a new car and you've saved up in order to do so, well, then you can dip into your savings account in order to purchase the car. If you are dipping into your savings account to top up your transaction account, well, then something's gone wrong and you need to go back and revisit your budget. You need to decide if you are spending too much or if your budget is too tight. And now if your budget's too tight, well, then you need to adjust your budget, adjust the amount that's either going into your transaction account or adjust the allocations coming out 
but you can't be dipping into your savings account in order to top up your transaction account. Once you've built up one month's buffer in your transaction account, then your next job is to start building your savings account. And you do this by allocating surplus cash flow from the spendings account into the savings account. The level of money that you're aiming to accumulate in your savings account should be a minimum of three months of expenses. And this is what we call your emergency fund. And now I don't wanna waffle on too much about emergency funds in this video because it's gonna be long enough as it is. But an emergency fund is very important for your financial security and just your financial well-being. If your savings account is ever below this level, then you need to allocate money in order to top it up and you should be making it a priority of yours. There is no ceiling or maximum amount that you should have in your savings account and you might be holding substantially more money in there than the proposed emergency fund. So for example, if you're saving up for a car, you might have an additional 30,000 on top of your emergency fund sitting in your savings account. If you have a mortgage, then ideally your savings account should be an offset account. Now, I've probably said this many a times, but I love offset accounts. I think they are the best product that banks have bought out. Now, if you don't know what an offset account is, let me give you the quick gist of it. You can think of an offset account like a high interest savings account, but instead of generating you interest, it saves you interest. It does this by using your savings to offset your loan balance, thus reducing the interest payable. So for example, if you have a $400,000 loan linked to an offset account with 50,000 in savings, you only pay interest on the difference between the loan balance and the offset balance, which in this example is 350,000. This is always gonna be better than any high interest savings account because the interest that you can generate on your savings is always gonna be lower than the interest that you can save or against your mortgage. And the reason for this is because banks work on what's called a net interest margin or a NIM. And that's basically the difference between the interest that they give out on deposits and the interest that they receive on loans. So in summary, if you have a mortgage, then ideally your savings should be sitting in an offset account. Now, just be aware that a lot of the times there is a fee involved in having an offset account. Banks will generally put you under a package. Um, and also you typically can't have an offset account against a fixed loan, although there are a few lenders out there that will allow it. Some lenders will also allow you to have multiple offset accounts, which is awesome. And basically all of your accounts should be an offset. If you don't have a mortgage, then a high interest savings account will have to do. And just be aware that if you have over $250,000 sitting in cash, then you probably want to spread it out across different deposit takers. And the reason for this is because of the Australian government's financial claim scheme. Under this scheme, deposits of up to 250,000 are protected by the Australian government, provided you're with an authorized deposit taking institution or ADI. You're only covered for up to 250,000 per ADI. So if you have more than this, you may wish to spread some cash across multiple ADIs. Now that we've introduced a savings account into the mix, your account setup should be starting to look like this. This is the account structure that I believe applies to every person or pretty much every person out there. From here, you can start to add additional accounts to suit your particular situation and your particular needs. And I'm gonna go over some of those additional account structures with you now. If you like to use a credit card in order to get points and rewards and things like that, well then I don't have an issue with that. In this instance, your credit card will be linked up with your transaction account, your expenses would come out of your transaction account, and every single month you would transfer money from the transaction account to the credit card to pay out the balance in full. However, just be very careful that you never carry a balance on a credit card. Every single month, you need to be paying out that card in full so you don't pay any interest on that card. Credit cards can quickly allow you to spend more than you earn, which is a spiral downwards that you just don't wanna get involved in. So if you are starting to pay interest on the credit card or if, you're, if you've got a running balance owing on the credit card, well then, no matter how good the points are, you need to get rid of it because it's not a healthy situation. So with the addition of a credit card, your account structure is going to start to look like this. When it comes to savings, I personally like to accrue my savings on top of my emergency fund in the sole savings account. 
but I know this doesn't work for a lot of people. Some people like to have separate savings accounts for separate purposes. So for instance, you have one savings account for your emergency fund, one for a holiday and one for a car purchase. There is nothing wrong with having multiple savings. If having multiple savings accounts lets you track, manage, allocate and automate your cash flow better, then by all means go for it. The only thing I would say is to prioritize the emergency fund before you start on any additional savings accounts. Like we discussed previously, you shouldn't have a savings account until you have one month's buffer in your transaction account. So once you have the one month buffer, you add up the three month in the emergency fund. And then once you've got that, then you can start to save up in additional savings accounts if you like. Ideally, all of your savings accounts will be offset accounts if you have a mortgage that is, but if you only have access to one offset account, then pick the savings account with the largest balance because this is going to make the most difference. With the addition of multiple savings accounts, your account structure is going to start looking like this. Now, please be aware that I've only shown an additional two savings accounts for the purpose of X and Y. However, you can have as many as you like. If you are in a serious, committed, long-term relationship and you're on this financial journey with your partner, then it makes sense to structure your accounts together. Some couples like to share every single dollar, in which case your account structure is not gonna change much from what we already discussed. The only real difference would be that your transaction account should be held in joint names, so you both have access and visibility over it, and your savings account will either be in joint names or if there is a partner with a lower marginal tax rate and you're holding your savings in a high interest account, well then from a tax perspective, it might make sense to own the account in the name of the partner with the lowest marginal tax rate. My wife and I, we personally like to have a little bit of financial independence from each other. So this means having our own accounts, which we can make our own purchases from without the need to consult each other on every little thing. We like to be able to buy each other gifts from off the back of our own money rather than coming out of a joint account and just really having that little piece of independence that comes from having your own pot of money. Now, don't get me wrong, majority of our money is pulled because we are working towards the same financial goals and objectives, but we just like to have that little piece of independence that comes with your own little stash of cash. And at times relationships can be hard enough without arguing about your partner bought six cups of coffee this week and you only bought two cups. Now, if everything's coming out of a joint pool, well then that might lead to a little bit of an argument. But if, you've, if the cups of coffee are coming out of your own individual accounts and your partner wants six and you want two, well, power to you. So if you're like us and you want that little bit of financial independence from each other, well then you would both have your own individual transaction accounts, which receive your income. From there, you need to sit down as a couple and decide how much money you want to allocate into the joint transaction account, whether that be on a weekly basis, fortnightly basis or monthly basis. If there is a significant earnings discrepancy between the two of you, well then it's okay for one person to allocate more into the joint transaction account than the other. Or if there's a situation where one partner doesn't work, which is often the case when it comes to having children and things like that, well then it's okay for one person, the income earner, to be putting money into the joint transaction account and the other person to be taking some money out of the joint transaction account into their personal account to give them that little piece of financial independence. So with the inclusion of your individual accounts, your account structure can start looking like this. If you run a business, then you are definitely going to need a separate business account to receive all of the business income and pay for all of the business expenses. It's very important that you keep the business cash flow separate to your personal cash flow, as this really helps from a tax perspective, but also to help you track and manage your business and how your business is going. The business account should be owned by the structure that runs your business. So if you're a sole trader, then the business account should be in your name. If you're operating the business under a company, then the business account should be owned by the company. If you're operating the business under the trust, then the business account should be owned by the trustee of that trust. You should then have a plan for how your business account interacts with your personal accounts. So for instance, how much income are you gonna draw down from your business and how often? 
Now, I won't go into this in too much detail because again, this video is getting very long. So for now, just know that you need a little bit of a plan in place. You can also consider having a business account if you have an investment property, because sometimes when you have an investment property, it's nice to have all the income from that property go into a single account and all the expenses relating to that property come out of a single account. Again, this just makes it a lot easier come tax time. So with the addition of your business account, your account structure is gonna start looking like this. As you can see, your account structure is starting to get fairly complex. But just remember that of the, all those accounts, only two are fundamental. That is your transaction account and your savings account. All the additional accounts outside of that are optional and should be tailored towards your individual needs. But it's important to set up something that you're comfortable with, which is gonna allow you to track, manage, allocate, and automate your cash flow efficiently. But that's it for me today, guys. I know this was a long one. If you do like this longer, more comprehensive style of video, then let me know. Um, but otherwise, if you prefer the more short, sharp, get to the point kind of ones, then also let me know because at the end of the day, I'm making this content for you guys. So it'd be great to know which way you prefer. But thanks a lot for watching. If you did learn something new, give me the thumbs up and I will see you guys in the next one.